stand up. Hello, my friends, and happy Saturday. I hope you're having a good weekend and have a good weekend. I thought I would drop my conversation with Eric Siegel from yesterday here for you because it was really good. He was a little Dr. Gloom, but I had a lot of jokes. I am, for some reason, still doing my best to be optimistic and be in good spirits and hope and wish for the best, despite all the chaos that we are dealing with in the world and in our own lives. So I continued that spirit today, and hopefully I will each and every day here on the podcast. I cannot do it without you, so please send me your money. Five bucks or more a month, patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. This is a brief, bare-bones introduction to one of our favorite guests. We always love talking to Eric Siegel. Let him know on Twitter at Eastbin Siegel. Listen to his podcast, Supreme Myths. Get his book, read his blog, where he contributes to Dorf on Law, and so much more. We absolutely love this guy. Our conversations are always great, and today is one of the better ones for sure. I really enjoyed it. I hope you do, too. Let's do it. Siegel is back. I've been wanting to talk to you for... A week. I'm happy you're here. Good morning. By the way, great stuff with Al. Alex Aronson is really doing great work. He was on your show yesterday, I think, or whenever it was. And he was great. And thanks for having him on. We need more people like him. Say more about him because I'm super impressed by him, his knowledge, his ability to communicate, and his unparalleled passion for, I think, justice uh, the way I see it. He used to work for Senator Whitehouse, and he was a big part of Senator Whitehouse's last 10, 15 years of trying to get the American people to see that dark money is why we have Kavanaugh, Barrett, and Gorsuch, among others. But mostly, he's really on the front lines of Supreme Court reform. He's doing a good job. I hope his voice, he's been on my, I hope his voice becomes much louder and amplified. He talks about a, a, a loosely organized network of, of people who are trying to do what he's doing and that he was he's been disappointed by them as of recently. And I forget exactly what he, what he was saying. But do you see my question to you is, do you see a, an organized group of people advocating in the way that he is in different ways through different organizations? Because obviously we've talked about this a million year a million times. They've been doing it on the right for 30 years with huge organizations and billions of dollars. So I haven't, we haven't really talked about the movement, the anti or the progressive led movement of that. So what are your thoughts? A couple of things. They've been doing it for 50 years, not 30 years or 60 years, actually. I was thinking of the eighties, the early eighties, late seventies. Yeah, right. the, the late, the late, the mid to late seventies is when originalism started to really become a political movement. Then by the mid eighties, we had Bork, Scalia and Ed Meese advocating it. But when did you have to answer that question, Pete, I want to tell your audience, because your audience and I, so they've seen me yelling and ranting. (laughs) They've seen me happy. Today, you're getting scared, Eric, just for the record. Um, I think probably a lot of your audience feels the same way. So we can get about that. We can get which is why I've been very positive and optimistic. And and it's not fake. It's real. So go ahead. No, And and I appreciate that. And we all appreciate that. You bring that joy to our lives. But I'm just telling you what you're getting today. You're getting someone who's looking at the world and feeling scared. Dr. Um, Doom, right. Professor Gloom. No, today is just gloom, not doom. Oh, oh OK. All right. We'll take it. We'll take it. Go ahead, Professor Gloom. We're asking about Alex and whether uh, other people are fighting for this. And it's so frustrating for me, Pete, across several layers. First of all, I was fighting for this 30 years ago. Sure. And I was by myself. And I, and I was by myself. So we're going to talk about, I know Alex is in favor of term limits. I'm obviously in favor of term limits. Biden is about to, for the Supreme Court justices, Biden is about to come out allegedly and propose term limits. And I just want to say, Pete, as as recently as 2014, 2014, 10 years ago, I tried to get a bipartisan group of law professors, conservatives and liberals, famous names, much more famous than my name, to put together an op-ed about term limits huh. and how it's insane that we're the only country in the world where justices have this much power and tenure for life. And I got a few liberals on board, not as many as you would expect, and virtually no conservatives. And at that point, the American public didn't want term limits. The polls showed that they they didn't care. So what Biden must be seeing is that now the American people care about term limits, because the only explanation for what he's doing is political. We'll talk about him in a second. But going back to Alex, the reality is that the left that Alex represents, the Supreme Court reform movement that I hope I represent to some degree. We have no power, no money, no authority 
compared to the tremendous amount of money on the right. And that's one of the things that makes this battle so difficult. The Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation and Cato are, and then all other, a bunch of right wing litigation firms. They are bank, ba- they are bankrolled by billionaires and they're bankrolled by billionaires in ways that are hidden and secret. And they're just like 40 years ahead of the left on this. There are so, many organizations, just to be clear, see how here I am being positive, giving everybody the flip side. Yeah. That are progressive or democratic or whatever you want to call them, Earth One organizations, from environmentalist organizations to organizations like the ACLU or Americans United, who do file suit and who do bring cases. And those are similar to the strategies of the right, like the Christian nationalist organizations like ADF and, and, and so many others. Now, the difference in funding and then the difference in their purpose is obviously stark, but there are hundreds of organizations that are well funded that do file lawsuits and do combat at the highest levels at the highest courts on many of these issues. There are a lot of well-meaning people trying to do good work. <laughs> I'm not what's interesting, Pete. So when Alex left Senator I don't mind, I don't think he would mind me relaying this conversation. When he left Senator White uh, Senator's office, he and I had a long talk on the phone. When I had said to him, the senator has been trying to do this now really for 15, 20 years. He's really been work. He does PowerPoints. He does presentations. He talks over. The, he, no one can work. He's worked as hard as we can expect any human being to do. And it's been wildly ineffective and nothing has changed. Um, and, one the, and, and I said to Alex, we need a different perspective on what this institution is. Everyone in your audience knows my views on this. Yeah. And but and his point was valid. His point was, yeah, the world, the, the the real world, not the academic world, not your podcast world, not when you go on shows like Pete. So not that world, but the power world is just not ready for that. Democrat senators aren't ready for that. Like they're not they, they want to blame the people on the court, not the court itself. I understand that perspective, but it's short term. And I think in the long run, Pete, and maybe I'm wrong, I'm not. I study social movements. I am not an expert on social movements. I do study them. They take a really long time. Yeah. So I think 30 to 40 years from now, there's going to be a very strong, I think we're going to have a much different Supreme Court if we have a country, but that's 30 to 40 years from now. It's going to, it took them 50, it took them 50 years to reverse Roe and they had Republican justices the whole time, right? The, the Supreme Court has been dominated by Republicans forever and it took them 50 years to reverse Roe. Just these things happen really slowly. Let's and, do- uh, I don't, I, and one last thing. Normally, I wouldn't care about that. I would say, oh, so it takes change takes time. Important change takes time. That's not a criticism. Pete, I'm not sure we have time. Fair enough. But anybody's guess, I think that there's a huge opportunity, obviously, as I thought there was if Hillary Clinton would have won in 2016. And if the Democrat wins in 2024 to make important structural changes at the Supreme court and in other places. So I'm going to stay positive on the very, very possible po- possibility that the Democrat will win. And then all of this hand you know, it has to be, it has to be the house, the Senate and the presence. Okay. So let me come back to that as to why it is, but you said we need a different perspective on the Supreme court that it's not a lot of us blame the justices, the people uh, on the court and not the institution itself. So if you were to put a soundbite out that is a different perspective on the court, and you've done this many times, what do you think is the best way to see it today, given where we're at? I think that I've yet to, the premise of my argument is that a judge's job, any judge, doesn't matter, America, Greece, Italy, Spain, France, I'm only talking about relatively free countries now, okay? But in democracies, in relatively free countries, a judge's job, is to take pre-existing law, which often is going to lead to gaps in, in, in the new case, but take pre-existing law seriously and use it to decide what's the best answer for the current case. And no one thinks that a judge's job is to look at the world and go, you know what? I think the world would be better this way. I think the world would be better that way. So I'm going to make my decision. I don't care what law says. If the Supreme Court admitted tomorrow that it doesn't care about prior law, it's just going to do what it thinks is best today. We wouldn't call it a court, but that's what they do. That's what they've always done. Liberals and conservatives, moderates, Democrats, the Republicans, doesn't matter. 
This is a policy making legislative type institution that people want to call a court. So it's fitting a round a square peg in a round hole. And we can never make progress until we understand that the task we're asking these men and women to do is not a judicial task. It is a legislative task. And we should make appropriate rules for that job. And one of the most important rules should be, tell us exactly the reason why you're ruling the way you did, so we can at least have a good debate. Tell us why you think abortion is not a constitutional right. The reason they gave us was that because it's not mentioned in the Constitution and it's not part of our history. But those reasons aren't, they don't, that's not why Alito voted that way. You know that. Everybody knows that. It's not why Thomas voted that way. They don't like abortion. That's why they voted that way. So until we get truth and honesty, we have no chance. And there was a moment in American history when I was the only person saying this plus two or three others. But today, a lot of people are saying the institutional problems with this court, which is why I assume President Biden and his people have decided that it's now time finally (laughs) to make an issue of this because the Supreme Court commission that he authorized was a joke. Everybody knew it was a joke. No one took it seriously. Ended up not being serious. They didn't make any proposals. It's like it never happened. So what, so Pete, my question to you, I have a question for you this morning, okay? Why do you think the people who are running Biden's stuff, why did they think this is the appropriate moment to attack the Supreme Court and the way they're doing it, as opposed to simply complaining and grousing about the decisions? This is different. This is serious reform. That can never ha- that's never going to happen. Why are they doing it now? Is it the immunity case? Is that the thing? In case people don't know, the president teased that they would be announcing these proposals to reform the court. And what you're saying is the president can't do that. Of course, it has to go through Congress. And so it's just a proposal. But it's the kind of thing that you say on a campaign when you're on a campaign. If I'm elected, I'm going to do this. And earlier you said no previous president. As far as I know, no president in American history has advocated for abolishing life tenure. Before. My, my guess is my guess, and I have no information on this, is that the Biden campaign and administration have been thinking about this for a long time. They got numbers and from their focus groups, probably that showed that based on what happened in June, which was an obliteration of so much of what we knew, opinions had changed, not to mention the fact that this is a Hail Mary because of the criticism on him. What can we do to put the spotlight on the campaign, go on the offense, and this is what they came up with, and then the president got COVID. Yes. That's I mean, it's like, it, 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 it's been really hard for the Biden administration to, or for anybody to manage the news, to control what happens in our conversation, because Donald Trump is alive. And as long as he's alive doing stuff, it's very hard to wrestle it back from him. And he manages it better than anybody, waiting to the very last second to introduce J.D. Vance. I just realized why I was sad this morning. Thank you, Therapist Pete. You, we can have a show, Therapist Pete. How's that? Um, what feels to me like, and I hope this resonates, Pete, I'm sorry, I don't mean to bring your audience down. I'm not yelling. I'm not ranting. I feel like everything is working against the Democrats and everything is working in the favor of the Republicans. Things we can't control. COVID, assassination attempts. I just saw this morning that Biden gave an interview yesterday or or sometime in the last 24 hours. He basically said, yeah, I appointed that black guy to be secretary of defense or whatever. He's. Yeah, it was a really it was a very cringeworthy moment. He was given an interview to BET. And if you hadn't heard it yet, it is it's real hard it's, it's to, to hear. But what is your point that it seems like everything is going bad for Democrats? Go ahead. Well, the assassination attempt is the best thing that could have happened for Trump. What could be better for his campaign than that? I, can't I, think of I agree that be, the assassination attempt uh, failed. Yeah. Had it succeeded, it would have been probably <laughs> had Trump been killed. I think we all know that it would have accelerated everything that he believed in it would have made him a martyr. And I think things would have gotten Can uglier. Can we talk about that for a second? Sure. Um, so that's, that, that is the conventional wisdom among the political pundit class. I have historians telling me something different. I have academics, and I'm not suggesting in any way that academics know more than pundits about No, this. I'm interested. I was going to do an interview with the historian Ken Davis on the history of attempted and successful history. assassination. So I'm, I am interested, although I do think, caveat, all history doesn't matter now, given the social media age. <laughs> no, I was going to, well, I think I was going to make a, maybe a slightly different point than that, although I, I'm not sure. But the people I'm reading ab- about what Trump is, what is this whole thing, is it what the movement is ever since 2016. So there's three possibilities. It's a cult 
It's a social movement. It's a combination of the two. And people who have studied those three things, study cults, study social political movements in America, uh, and study combinations of the two, Pete, if it's a cult, cutting off his head will end it. And there might be some violence in the short run, but it would end it. If it's a political movement, as you said earlier, it will accelerate all the things that we don't like about Trumpism. If it's a hybrid of the two, which I think is the right answer, right? It's somewhere of a combination between yeah. the cult and the political movement. Then here's the bottom line. We don't know. Right. If it's more of a cult, then Trumpism will die out if he's dead. If it's more of a movement, you're right. He'll become a martyr and it'll accelerate it. And I don't know what the I'm very opinionated. I'm a stubborn guy. I have no idea. And the experts I'm talking to have no idea. It's some combination of those two things. And it's really hard. But what I'm thinking this morning is it feels like everything that involves luck is going against us. Yeah, maybe that'll change. Maybe that'll change. You know, I think year. that's I'll be positive again. I think that is one of the most normal things in life. When it rains, it pours. You yeah. lose your job. You get divorced. Your kid gets sick. You it feels like you can't take it. God's never going to give you more than you can handle. Has always been a hilarious, sad thing to say to people, I think. I sometimes it's helpful, but I think it's ridiculous. Of course, God will give you more than you can handle and you will break and you will be broken and maybe for a while and maybe forever. I don't know. But if you want to look at it, you're a big sports fan. I used to be a New York Jets fan. It's always been bad. It's never been good. As wait, a wait, 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 wait. I was nine years old when Joe Namath led the Jets. Okay. So my life, it's always <laughs> been bad. I stand yeah. by what yeah. I said. So I think I'm going to cling to this fantasy that we're going to have a different ticket. Potentially, it is going to be. Hey, is a, that your favorite? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing you publicly on this. Is it your position Biden should drop out? I don't really. I, I don't really. I think probably he should, but giving it saying that it's my position almost makes me feel like it's I'm putting my. Imprimatur on something that I didn't mean that. I, mean, I don't, I mean, and I don't mind. I don't mind giving you my opinion, but my opinion often changes. And I think, but at this point, yeah, I think given the most convincing argument to me is that the people closest to him, many of the people closest to him, uh, have said that he has been bad for a while, and that's you know why some of these celebrities that did that fundraiser and they raised thirty million dollars for him. George Clooney writes the piece because he was hanging out with him that night. He's, he's, he seems a little bit he's in, he's out, he's in, he's out, and so regardless of his mental state, his consciousness, I think a lot of people make a good point. Let him just stay in, and we'll vote for him. But at some point, you lose. I think enthusiasm and voters and there's this constant concern between now and then about his health. I think they I think that should be put to rest. And I think that you could have. I think our best chance up at this point is a different ticket. So, yeah, I, I, I think I agree. I think I agree with that. Here's what I don't know how to think about. So, first of all, we both agree, I assume that. a And let me just. Can I just, the positive point was, if there is a different ticket, it has a good chance of winning. A lot of people say any Democrat can win. And if that's the case, then a lot of this concern and hand rigging will be for naught. And that is how I think about my life as much as I can every day. I try to stay in the moment and not worry about what might happen. And that's some ancient Marcus Aurelius right there. <laughs> Somebody else has been reading Marcus Aurelius. Somebody really famous. Uh, I think it's I think it's Eckhart Tolle, and he just rewrote it for today and made millions and a lot of others. I think, no, I mean some anyway. It doesn't matter. So I'm not going to argue with any of that. I like all of that. I wish I was in your space. My my instinct is that the Democrats have not convinced me that what they've done in the there's nothing they've done in the past that convinces me they'll do the right thing here in terms of strategy, in terms of political strategy. But I hope they do. I guess I think Pete that here's what I know. Here's what I don't know how to think about. You and I agree that a, a Biden three times sicker than he is today, 10 times sicker than he is today, would be better than Trump because he would separate He would surround himself by people you and I. Trust. I don't care. No. Yeah, because I don't think he's I don't think the president runs the country. I think it's right, right. Can I finish this thought. Yeah. So, oh, so we both agree. Frankly, we both agree that the, the, the that, you know, that Sweeney, my dog, would I'd vote for Sweeney over Trump. There's no human. There's no person on the planet other than maybe Putin. I wouldn't vote for over Donald J. Trump. No one. I'd vote for Ted Cruz. I'd vote for any of them. Over Kim Jong Un. Kim Jong Un. Maybe not him. But here's my point. Here's what I don't know how to think about. Pete, 
you and I know, the whole world knows, that Joe Biden is not physically able to do the job as president. I have to believe that given close elections, that's going to make all the difference in the world. So if I'm right about that, then obviously he has to step away. But I'm also not sure he should be president, Pete, because he shouldn't be president. Yeah. Now, I know we have a binary choice, and that's what makes this so complicated and so difficult. I don't so, – because he shouldn't be president because he's too old and can't do the job, you mean? He can't give interviews. He, no, yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a, a fair and important point that it's a tough thing to admit. But uh, if, yeah, if he can't give interviews, much less if he can't talk to other world leaders, if other world leaders right. are concerned and, and, and so on, yeah. then I think all of those, all of those things are problems. But I will also push back on your Democrats always find a way to screw things up. I still am this. I, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say, uh, I, let me be clear what I said. Okay. They've not impressed me in the past with their political acumen. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so they have impressed me in their past with their political acumen, and maybe that's because of my view on life as a half glass full, and maybe it's because I've covered the granularity of policy and, and, and governing in this country at several different levels. But the triumphs that I've seen in the 15 years that I've covered Congress and elections – are life changing for so many people in such important ways. And most importantly, this Biden administration, what they actually got done. Campaigning is one thing. Governing is another. Governing is always very hard. And they got so much accomplished in the past four years. And so I think that's we should always talk about that. We should applaud. And that is definitely a cause for optimism. And if the Democrats win again. I do think we have a good chance of of moving past. And because I work with so many grassroots organizations and go and talk with them and see them up close, I see the little triumphs that they get in their organizations day by day. And I know sometimes you, you, you lose big as well. And it's hard. We won our board of election. We lost our board of election. It's really hard. But I'm in it for the wins and the things that make life even yeah. 10% better for, especially for people who are in much worse situations than I'll probably ever be in. So that's a rosy and smart outlook. Yesterday, a local news channel here in Atlanta came to my house to film me talking about project 2020. Now, which house did they come to? <laughs> I am now giving Pete the finger. Oh, he can, for, he can post it if he wants or not. Straight straight digit. For the for those listening. Yeah, let's get into um, Project 2025. I wanted to ask you about it. Go ahead. I, what I, the point I want to make, and I'm really listening to what you're saying, Pete, because I, I am looking to be less depressed. Everything, All the gains that you're talking about at the grassroots levels and the local levels, because let's be honest, at the national level, there's been a lot of shit for a long time. But you're right. Most of America doesn't is run at the grassroots level, and, and your town hall and your community is all very important. Yeah, get that. involved. But what 2025 wants to do is reverse all of that. And it's very clear. It's very Their agenda could not. I will give them one thing. They're not hiding the ball. They are openly calling for patriarchy. They are openly calling for a biblical perspective on the family unit, biblical perspective on the family unit. And Pete, if Trump wins, HHS is going to be staffed with these people. And there's nothing at the local level that can be done. If the Trump administration, and it will do this, decides to pass these regulations and laws that basically Trump preempt and destroy local decision making, for example, that a Trump administration will take the abortion drug off the market pretty much, probably, and things like that. So Project 2025 is exactly the opposite of the gains you were just talking about. And it really makes me nervous since 80 percent of their advisors slash authors slash participants are either current or former Trump advisors. And the fact that Trump denies connections to 2025 just tells us that he's all over to 2025, because obviously he's always lying about what he's doing. So this 2025 thing needs to be taken really seriously because it hits a nerve in, in middle America. And it's basically a call to go back to the 1950s. And this is what I decided yesterday, Pete. And I think it's a good insight. I do. I don't have many of these when it comes to like politics, but I think this is one. What Project 2025 is all about and the nerve that Trump is tapping into is a return to an America prior to the civil rights movement, the women's lib movement and gay rights movement. Yeah. They, they, and more recently, the trans movement. But that's just very recent. They want to go back to America before that. And there are a lot of lower middle class and poor white folks in swing states 
for whom that message resonates, sadly. And that's why I'm scared, sad, and depressed. Can you give make me feel better about that? Yeah, I think that's a minority view in America. And I think that as long as we talk about those things the way that you just did, it's good. This Project 2025 is the scariest shit. And I have yeah. argued for a long time that people are often, I've argued, scholars argue that people are motivated to vote out of fear on all sides, obviously. But what are progressives uh, uh, afraid of versus what are conservatives afraid of? So often on the right today, they're afraid of shit that isn't happening. Stop the steal. <laughs> and they're not worried about things that are happening, like climate change. They're not worried about COVID. They don't get vaccinated and so on. So I think Project 2025 is scaring not progressives, but it's scaring girls who have never heard of politics that look at TikTok and hear what their lives are going to be like. And they're like, wait, what? And I think that's important. So I think the more that we talk about it, the more that we make it transparent. And there's plenty of time to do that. And I'm seeing it happen all over the Internet. The better. It's terrifying and it should be talked about and it's motivating people who are not political. So I think that you're going to have a landslide of people who wouldn't even vote coming out because weeds on the ballot, abortions on the ballot. And they saw a TikTok that they're going to have to be handmaidens. Listen, the, the, the person most responsible for 2025 has openly called for patriarchy. That's happening in 2024. Kevin Roberts. It's an, ama- it's yeah. an amazing it's an amazing thing if you think about it. He's uh, who is it that told me he's Opus Day. Yeah. Ke- so. The, what the ultra I'm Catholic also starting the, to realize that I did not realize before. And by the way, people like Senator Whitehouse and Alex Aronson have realized this even more than I have hmm. for a long time now. I believe me, no one knows more about Leonard Leo than I do. I'm going to go on a limb and say that. I've ah, interesting. But what I didn't know is how interconnected it all is. Oh, yeah, really? I had it. I, I, I it's funny because people. I heard your interview. I re-listened to your interview with Sarah Posner on Supreme Myths. Yeah, and great, what she seemed to elucidate for you surprised me because you suggested her work to me and the work of people like Kathleen Stewart. And now there's so yeah. many others who are writing about Christian nationalism and so on. Yeah. They all write about those connections. Tim, obviously, Jeff Charlotte. Go ahead. No, it was Sarah's book that actually got me huh. like, two standard deviations more upset or depressed than I was. What I didn't realize, I knew Trump went to Russia in 2013 for Miss Universe, which, by the way, always struck me as a really strange thing. Like at the time, in, no, in 2013, I said, that's a really strange thing. And then when six Republican senators go to Moscow on July 4th, 2016, on a trip they've never explained. When, what's his name, the guy from Ukraine who went to prison and then Trump pardoned Manafort is back last night. Yeah. When, when a convicted felon is giving a speech yeah. last night, Peter Navarro. Now, was that law and order night that all the criminals spoke or was that? <laughs> I don't know. But all I can say is this. I am starting to, this is what's scaring me. I think it's all really well organized by a few really smart people. And that's yeah. what, that's terrifying. Sarah Kenzior writes a lot about this kind of international. It's not a conspiracy. I guess it's technically it could be a group of organized criminals wherever they live in countries all over the world. Corrupt criminals who cheat every rule they can and every tax law they can. And then sometimes whack people out of buildings and sh- so on. And you I know, think J.D. Vance said in the Senate a few weeks ago, it was, I, I, I'm only 98 percent sure it was Vance. But a prominent Republican said, I think it was Vance, said, we want to bring Viktor Orban's style of, yeah. of, of education to America. That's insane. It's it's an, not, yeah, it's an, it's iron, not, he's, not, he's not a fascist like Hitler and Mussolini, but he's a neo-fascist. He, he, yeah. he cleansed the there's so brain. much. There's so much that you can do with control of government, and that's what they want to do. Yes. And, and yes. previous yes. Republican presidents haven't necessarily gone, well, they, it's been extreme – so many things, especially economics and regulations and so on. But that's the other thing that happened, Pete. Sorry, my list of Siegel depressing items. This Go ahead. Time, I saw a clip of George W. Bush last night. Oh, yeah. Was, he was really good. <laughs> and I'm thinking we're now living in a world. He was really George good w. at what? Uh, whatever he was saying was sensible. I forget what he was saying. I think it's about immigration, but it was sensible. In a speech. Uh, we're we're, we're yeah. in a world where George, where we're like, wouldn't. Like, we'd all take him over Trump by three standard deviations. 
And he was terrible. He led us into war. He destroyed Iraq. Yeah. He was terrible. And I would yeah, he see he only destroyed another country and a generation of American veterans. He didn't destroy as much. I was going to say he didn't destroy the world. The, the truth is that it wasn't totally his fault, but it was Republicans fault that the economy collapsed, destroying a generation of homeowners and, and college graduates. I have no theory about that, Pete. Can we change subjects? But that was but that. But yeah, go ahead. So I heard, maybe I mentioned this last time I was with you. This theory impressed me so much. This is not my area of expertise. I'm just repeating something an expert told me. In American history, if you account for age, longevity of life, if you count for, because we live longer now, there was, until the 1980s, there had never been a generation of young white men who were like billionaires. Like, what, it took you to be 40 years old, 50 years old. You didn't get rich at 25 or 30. That didn't happen in America very often. Yeah. Leaving aside celebrities and boxers and Michael Jordans, it didn't happen. In the 1980s, these spoiled white guys coming from suburban America who grew up with a silver spoon in their mouth took over Wall Street, and they made a tremendous amount of money, like more money than you could possibly imagine, in a very short period of time. It was so addictive. It was so empowering to them that they just kept getting greedier and greedier, leading to derivatives. They didn't care, leading to the mortgage crisis. And we shouldn't have billions. 25-year-olds, unless they're the best basketball player in the world, shouldn't be billionaires. I think that theory is actually very right for a lot of things. Uh, I, 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 I think it's – the idea that there are any billionaires is absolutely <laughs> reprehensible. Any species would look at this – if you took deer or butterfly or, or any species, even like super selfish ones that live alone and try to eat everything, they'd be like, I don't think I should have all – <laughs> of everything. That made me laugh from a really deep place. Thanks. And furthermore, I think that the reason why you have so many more young billionaires is because of the internet, what the internet's created in terms of technology opportunities. Right. And I think that, all, what that it's a good thing because it creates so much more opportunity for on, entrepreneurship and startups, but it's a bad thing because if two guys start a company because they got, they borrowed money from their rich friends and they build the company and then they sell the company, which is how a lot of these young guys become billionaires. Th they shouldn't get all that money. <laughs> they don't deserve it. It should be distributed amongst everybody else who built the company as well as paid off in tons of taxes. You sure. should not get that much money for anything that you do. And I have sure. no idea why you think athletes should, they should give that yeah. money to the fucking usher in the arena. Now, I, I don't want so to argue the athlete part. Wait a minute. Stop. Stop. I want to be clear. Uh, we are taping this at 10.06 a.m. on July 18th, 2024. And Pete Dominic, finally, after 12 years of me knowing him, or 13 years or whatever it's been, has come out of the closet. Pete is a communist. I'm glad to hear it. Ugh. <laughs> it does such an injustice. Um, it does such an injustice to communism. Do you know what these basketball players are getting paid now? It's unbelievable. So there's a new collective bargaining agreement. Yeah. And all these athletes, uh, several athletes, except for well, female athletes, apparently. And we right, can talk about well, the economics right, of that. Except for one female athlete. But they make these, you big money in sponsors. I just saw players are like making 50, 60, 70 million yeah. dollars a well, year. I mean, they deserve how can it. They work that much in a free market. It's hard to believe. But maybe they are. I don't know. Anyway. So, so um, before I let you back, go, you only have a few back. more. You only have a few more minutes. And we didn't talk about the classified documents case. Okay, so Judge Cannon has been on she, – she, she is either grossly incompetent or corrupt or both, probably both. She was never going to have this case go to trial. I said that on your show, what, a year ago, a year and a half ago? Mm. I said – what I also said on your show was of all the cases, that was the one most easily proven. Right. So here's who I'm going to blame. I am going to blame the Department Smith. He should have found a way to not file this case in that part of Florida. He could have filed it in D.C., and she, this decision that the independent counsel is illegally named has been rejected by eight different courts over 40 years. It's an insane position. It's going to get reversed, probably, although you never know anymore. Pete, we were all wrong about the immunity decision, all of us. I don't know a single commentator who's, a, who's in an accredited American law school who predicted the court would do something terrible with the immunity case. We all thought they were going to delay it and then issue a pretty good opinion. That's what we thought. Instead, they delayed it and issued one of the worst opinions in American history. So I don't know what they would do, but I, so who knows? But I have to think, 
I have to think this decision will be reversed unless Trump wins, in which case the case goes away anyway, so it doesn't matter. You have to think this thing will be reversed on appeal to the, By the way, 11th are, Circuit, which is very I, I conservative. Want to, I want to, so I had experience litigating against the independent counsel who investigated Iran-Contra. I was on the government side, and I saw what happens to a prosecutor who only has one task. I want to lay out for your audience, Pete, if I could. Give me two or three minutes to do this. Why this is such a difficult problem. In America, the United States Department of Justice, acting under the president of the United States, has exclusive authority to prosecute federal crimes. Now, Congress decides what a federal crime is, and then the Justice Department, acting under the president, prosecutes that crime. The problem is, who investigates the president? If the president is accused of committing crimes, or the president's highest officers are accused of committing crimes... It doesn't make a lot of sense for the president to appoint himself, to investigate himself. That doesn't, we don't, that's not how we do things. So we had, we need somebody else to do it, but our constitution doesn't give us a good clue as to how to do that. And when you take someone outside the executive branch, like the independent counsel to prosecute federal crimes, it does raise some separation of powers concerns for the following reasons. A friend of mine was on the independent council who looked into a guy named James Watt. For your younger audience, James Watt was secretary of the interior under Reagan, and he believed that the climate should be destroyed every day as much as possible, which is why Reagan appointed him to be secretary of the interior. Eventually, he committed some alleged crimes. He was investigated. My friend was on the commit, was on the, worked for the independent council. Pete, what saves us a little bit from terrible selective prosecution? is that prosecutors have too many crimes to investigate. So they can't investigate all crimes. So they prioritize, right? But if your job is to investigate just one person and you have unlimited time and money to do it, that's a system of justice that is not desirable. Hmm. And Justice Scalia said all of that in his dissent in Morrison versus Olson, which upheld the independent counsel statute. I think Scalia's dissent, which Kagan called his best dissent, and which most law professors would say is his best dissent, was spot on when it comes to policy, was completely wrong about constitutional law. (laughs) I don't think constitutional law prohibits what Smith is doing. I don't think constitutional law prohibits the decision to appoint an independent prosecutor outside the executive branch to investigate high-level illegality. But, Pete, it's a hard question. And I will tell you this. Lawrence Walsh, who was the independent counsel who investigated Iran-Contra, who eventually wrote a report, that said it was the highest level cover up in American history. That's Lawrence Walsh's statement. He was a Republican investigating Republicans. Watching litigating against him and watching his attitude, which was basically, I can do anything I want, anytime I want, you can't stop me, is not a good attitude for prosecutors. So this is a complex problem. Here's my bottom line, though. It is not up to Judge Cannon to fix that problem. It is not up to the Supreme Court to fix that problem. It is up to Congress to fix that problem. Right. And they have. They've authorized the attorney general to appoint these people to operate independently with the final say being in the attorney general's office. Whether that's good or bad is a close call. It is clearly not unconstitutional. That's why her decision is awful and wrong. And that's why any Supreme Court decision upholding it would be awful and wrong. And that's from a guy who is very conflicted about the policy. But I'm not conflicted about the constitutionality. Wow. How's that? That was thorough and interesting. And I love being in your classroom to hear your perspective. I wish we had somebody to argue with you about that. Yeah, I don't think many people argue. You citing Scalia is what makes it most fascinating, obviously. Well, no, but I'm citing him for the policy arguments because he was good at making Right. Policy. No, no that, but that alone. Yeah. I know you got to jump. I just do want to mention, I just see this break. I don't know if you saw this since we're taping. It's night four, the final night of the RNC this evening. Apparently, one of the speakers is Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> Why was Trump praising Hannibal Lecter? And I what think world? probably for this reason, to get him to come speak. <laughs> Pete, I came into this morning depressed and sad, and you've made me less depressed and sad. Thank Good. you very That's much. That's the idea. I love you, buddy. I'll talk to you later. I love you, too. Take right. care. There you go, Eric Siegel. 
for you on the weekend. Hopefully you appreciated that. Let me know. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Write a rating and review on Spotify and iTunes. You bumblebees, thank you very much for listening all the way to the end. I hope you have a great Saturday, a great weekend, and I will talk to you Monday, if not sooner. Trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creaky knees, you got to stand up. Stand up. I think you're driving wheels in leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep in tight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You got Listen well and it'll tell you not to run it.